Very welcome. Yeah, thank you. So let's see if I can share my screen. Okay, welcome everybody and thanks for having me here presenting my paper. I hope you can see the, the presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk about it, gender policy and intimate partner violence in Colombia. Um, as you all know, uh, you know, intimate partner violence is a, it's a major problem and it's common across the world. Uh, the main victims are probably the women that are exposed to the violence, but the, the other victims are the children and maybe the family at large. But then you have a lot of social and economic problems as well following this. Um, so it's a, it's a big issue, but until the 90s, it was, uh, at least in the international community and globally, not considered a major problem. It was like, it's a question about the family, the family matter. So it's, um, so um, it was first in the 90s that the international community recognized intimate partner violence as, uh, as, uh, as a problem. Um, and then early 90s, the UN had a big uh, meeting where they had a grand declaration on the elimination of violence against women. This was in 93. And the WHO put violence against women or intimate partner violence on its agenda in 1996. Uh, so it's pretty recent. And actually, if you remember the Millennium Development Goals, which were supposed to, to have been reached in the year 2000, there was no, nothing about intimate partner violence. In them. But, in, in the, but they are in, in, the social, in the Sustainable Development Goals. You have, you have, uh, they're included. So what I do in this paper, I, I try to evaluate if the gender policies initiated by UN has had an impact. Of course, I have to narrow down the question quite a lot. So I narrow it down to Colombia and I focus on a period between 2010 and 2015, uh, which is- Excuse me, excuse me, Dick. Uh, yeah. Are you changing slides? Because right now we only see the- Yeah, I'm, I'm not changing, no, I'm okay, not. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, okay. so I'll- uh, Sorry about that. This is a brief okay. background. Between 2010 and 2015, uh, which is the, because there was an increased effort in from 2008 to reduce intimate partner violence. Okay. I, I just want to emphasize also that I'm not claiming that the, these policies were initiated originally by, by the UN. I mean, the gender policies, they were really initiated by women activist groups and so on. Okay, so I'll first give you a brief background on intimate partner violence in Colombia, and then I'll talk a bit about earlier studies and then about methods, data, and results. Okay, uh, there was a very important meeting in Belém in Brazil in 1994, when a lot of countries, most countries in the Americas met and they actually signed an international treaty that criminalized all forms of violence against women. And Colombia signed this in 1995. And after that, Colombia and most of the other countries in, in, in <clears throat> on the American continent started formulating policies and laws that, that's supposed to, to protect women protect women's rights in general and, and intimate, protect them against intimate partner violence. In Colombia and in many other countries, this was a very slow and uneven process. And the government report in 2013 concluded that it had not had you know, any real impact. Um, and one reason was that there was really no, uh, it was not really taken seriously and the laws were not enforced and so on. Another reason was that some of the laws were really flawed and they had put women in a, you know, battered women in a weaker position than before. So there were sort of an act of domestic violence had to reported by the victim to be prosecuted. It was like this in Sweden as well before uh, in the seventies, but they introduced it in the year 2000. Uh, and then the victim could stop the process and the accused might not go to prison and, and uh, there could be reconciliation so they could agree without going to court. And of course, this put a lot of pressure on the battered women. Uh, and and uh, so these things had to change. So in 2008, 
in connection with the launching of a UN campaign called Unite to End Violence Against Women, um, Colombia changed a number of policies. And this, uh, this uh, initiative by the UN was due to the fact that they recognized that there was little progress across uh, countries, you know, when it came to reducing intimate partner violence. Uh, and it was at this time they, they created UN Women, for instance, which is a UN agency responsible for women rights. So it's, it was a major effort. Okay, uh, so what happened in Colombia? Well, they passed and changed a number of laws, particularly in 2008 and 2011. They removed this thing about domestic violence, violence and, and the, the victim reporting the crime. Uh, and according to uh, lawyers in, in Colombia, this constituted a major, major change. They also changed uh, the, the government agency that was supposed to monitor gender equality and so on and made it as an institution under the president directly. And then they developed a national plan uh, in 2004 to 10 or 2008, 2009, that included a whole chapter on intimate partner violence with a number of actions. And then you have a national agenda policy that came and it included 67 actions and, and there were 17 government agencies involved. And I think, you know, with things from, from collaboration with, with donors and civil society to, to, to all sorts of activities. And one important thing was that it was supposed to, all the departments were supposed to implement, the departments of the provinces in, in Colombia supposed to have their own uh, gender policies. Okay. Uh, what I do, I look at the, these gender policies in general. Um, earlier studies uh, that I looked at prevention uh, have, have a different focus, I think. That's my, I haven't seen anybody doing the same thing as I do. Uh, in Africa, intimate partner violence became, you know, got high on the agenda when they realized that it was highly correlated with, with HIV. So there have been some programs in Africa they intervene in one community, like a, like a neighborhood in, in Kampala in Uganda or some villages, and they try to change the social norms. So two famous ones are the SHARE trial and SASA. There are several. And they have seen an impact on intimate partner violence. And then there are several studies on very specific interventions, like, uh, like entertainment education, that's like soap operas, or changes in the edu women's education, or cash transfers. And then you have another set of, 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 um, of, of, um, of studies that look at laws, divorce laws, and, and criminalization or domestic violence, and so on. And the results here are, in general, positive to, towards an impact, not all don't find it, that there is a positive impact, but a number of them. However, the weakness of these studies, although important, is that it's widely recognized now that to reduce IPV, you need to look do a lot of things at the same time. There are many interconnected drivers, and, and prevention requires comprehensive strategies. So you have a combination of laws and national policy, policy programs and so on that includes all the stakeholders. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm focusing on, on these, these gender policies. Okay. So my, my research question is then, what was the impact of this renewed effort by the UN, that's UNITE, and uh, the collaboration with the government of Colombia on, on, on intimate partner violence? And to address this question, I need to identify the causal effect. You know? So what I, what I do is I use the fact that in Colombia, the central government passes the laws, but the departments, that is the provinces, they implement many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, they are quite independent in many ways, and, and, and the, the governors or, or the, 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 um, the governments of the departments are to a large extent responsible to the, 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 the people that live there. So in, in, in 2010, 2011, there were only nine departments that had a gender policy 
And a few were in the pipeline of, of adopting one. And only one department adopted a gender policy in 2010. So what I do, I assume that departments gender policy are more efficient in implementing national gender policies than the others. That actually that the gender policies have an impact. Uh, I based information on a study by, by the Spanish Development Agency, which really scrutinized all the, de the, the departments in 2010, 2011. And then I looked at the, um, the, um, the information on the website and so on. And these policies are long documents, but, but they list a lot of actions, like they should communicate to the public twice a year about the null tolerance about the IPV, they should be vacation programs in the schools, they should create a number of shelters, they should train the relevant employees, and they should implement different programs that, that support female victims. Uh, you can easily understand that just having a law uh, that, that, that that intimate partner violence is, is, is the crime doesn't, might not help because what, what shall the woman do if she's battered? She's got to go somewhere. So you need a shelter and then you need to have a rapid process where you actually grab the guy and so on. So you need a lot of things to, to have this impact. Um, <clears throat> so uh, here is the main specification. I use a method called difference and differences. I don't know if you all know econometrics or statistics, but I, so I'll be very brief here. Uh, the dependent variable is if the woman is reported on having experienced intimate partner violence during the last year. So I is the individual, D is the department, uh, and, and T is the year, and it's either 2010 or 2015 in the... Uh, in, the, um, in this formulation, in this model. And then I have a number of individual and household controls that I'll talk about later. And then I have some, some what we call department dummies of fixed effects in economics jargon, that is an intercept for each department. And then I have a variable that includes civilian deaths due to armed conflict. It's well known that, that, that civil wars and armed conflict actually lead to more intimate partner violence. There are several studies showing this. Uh, I studied a period when armed conflict declined drastically. So I control for this. The, um, the, the important variables are the, 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 the policy and the post. Post is a variable that is zero in 2010 before the so-called treatment, you know, before the, the policies were implemented. And it's, it's one after. And then I have a very variable called pol, which is the policies. So departments that had the policy have a, or zero in 2010 and one in 2015. And the others are zero all the time. And the coefficient of interest is beta two, which shows whether there was an effect or not. Okay. Uh, in addition, I have, I, I do some more, run some more regression to look at some other outcomes and relate, relate to APV. And I talk more about them later. Okay, so my data, I use demographic and health surveys. And these are nationally representative surveys uh, financed by the, by the US and carried out for a lot of developing countries uh, roughly every 50 years. Um, and they have a lot of detailed data about, you know, about, about the individuals, education, occupation, age, when they were born and so on that I use. Uh, then I have in these, most of these surveys, or many at least, there is a module on domestic violence. And in these modules, they ask specific questions to the women if they ever, or during the last year, uh, were affected by, were hit by the guy. For instance, did he push or shake you? Did he hit you with his hand? Did he kick you? And I have seven of those questions that are common to both surveys. Then I have one question on sexual violence, which is, is if he physically forced you to have sexual intercourse uh, when you didn't want to. So those are, are so, so, so that's the variables measuring intimate partner violence. And it's a binary indicator. If they answer yes to any other question, it indicates there is uh, violence. Some people like to sum them and so on, but that's not really what the, those the development, this model thought about it. You know, 
because we don't know the intensity and so on. We know just that it occurred. So it's a zero one. Then I used demographic and health service from earlier years to check for parallel trends, because it's important that uh, the, 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 the departments that adopted the policies and the others had the same development before introduction, before the introduction of the policies. Okay, economists always want to make sure that the assumptions made to draw conclusions here hold. And <clears throat> so I have just one graph to show you that they seem to hold. And this is the parallel trends assumption. So you can see the red line here are the departments that did not implement intimate part, uh, policy and the others, others implement. And the first, uh, the DHS in the first observation is 2005. And you can see the decline in the same way. And you can also see that, that the intimate partner violence was higher in, the, in the, the, the departments that implemented the policies. About 23% of the women reported being exposed to violence past year in 2005. And you can see the decline. And you can also see the change from 2010 to 2015, which come out from the regressions. I also look at, at a longer period from 2000, and I do some so-called placebo tests where I pretend that the policies were introduced in 2005 or 2010, and there's no, no impact. Okay, so this is the main result. So this is for, <clears throat> for the all women who currently or formerly were in union. You know, they had, they're married or they lived with somebody. And there it's, it's about partner violence the previous year. And you can see that first that I have about 50,000, 56,000 observations. Uh, and I have here, I report just physical and sexual violence, the combined effect actually most women they exposed to sexual violence were also exposed to physical violence. So the difference is not big. Uh, you can also see the mean in 2010. So it's about 20%. 20% of women were exposed to violence. Now I estimate four equations where I introduce the control step by step to see if they make a big difference. Because of course, it's in departments at random. You know, there was some reason, so they're, they're different some way. You saw, already saw that violence was more common in, in the ones that adopted the policies. Uh, so I have, you, if you want interest in all the controls, you can see them listed down there. I have, I have ethnicity, if the father beat mother, which has a strong impact whether, on whether the, the woman will be exposed to violence when she gets married, age of six encounter, education attainments, and so on. Um, the coefficient of interest is the one post and policy. So it's minus 0 0.4, roughly. And this means that 4%, it's a decline of 4 percentage points in the, the, the departments with the policy. And so you can see the baseline is point, it's 20. So it's sort of a 20% decline. Uh, you can also see that the change if you, if you control for this, there's no change in intimate partner values across between 2010 and 2015. So these models captures the whole change, the whole decline that is observed. Okay. The, the specification of, of the model or the, the, the choice of the departments that had a policy and did not have a policy, somewhat arbitrary. So I check whether I have a, a norm, more narrow measure changes the results or a broader one, and the broader one include the departments that had gender offices of some size, because some had gender policies or policies that affected women before. And, and, and there are some, you know, results are weaker for the narrow one and, and a bit stronger for the broader measure. Okay. To try to, to, to uh, provide support for these uh, results or try to understand why the policies had an impact, uh, I'll run some regressions. The most obvious one would be to look at the attitudes towards violence. Mm -hmm. So they ask questions whether to the women here, not to the men, unfortunately. Uh, and this, uh, I think there was a, something went wrong with the, with the survey. So there's no male module in their male date, no date on questions to the men. 
So they asked them if it's acceptable for the husband to beat his wife if she goes out without telling him, neglects her children, argues with the husband, refuses to have sex and so on. Uh, and here I use again a binary variable. What you can see that uh, uh, there is a negative effect in, in, in the departments that are treated. But you can see it's a positive effect to fill a big coefficient in the others uh, or in the post coefficient, which means that overall uh, attitudes towards violence became more uh, popular, if you want to call it, uh, which is a bit odd. I don't know how to explain this. One reason could be that the mean is very low. It's only, only 3% answers yes. Uh, so it could be just uh, a yeah, coincidence. Uh, but it, if I run the regression with these questions, I get the same result. It might be due to the, 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 the decrease in the armed conflict and a lot of the, maybe many of the, or some of the soldiers, former soldiers are part of the, 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 the survey, but I don't know. But there was a difference at least between the departments with the policy and the others. Then I look at lives with the partner, or if, or if they don't, you can see that in the departments with the policy, clearly more women live with the, the partner. Uh, and you can see there are fewer that plan to divorce or separate. You can also see that plans to divorce due to HPV is lower in the de departments with less intimate partner violence as expected. But you can also see that uh, many more women who plan to divorce claim that it's intimate partner violence that is highly significant and a, a large number. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, I ask if they, uh, they, I look for, for if they ask for help from an official authority, from the police, from the court or from other instances, then actually there's no difference between the department and there's a small decline. Mm -hmm. So the results are not sort of uh, you know, completely uh, consistent, but they do show that there was an impact, clearly. Finally, I, 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 I look at uh, another aspect of intimate partner violence. Among the questions um, about intimate partner violence, one question is if the husband accuses the woman of being unfaithful. I have not included it in my measure of, 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 of intimate partner violence, because I think it's a uh, I can discuss this, but I don't think it should be there. There are, of course, many reasons why a guy might accuse his wife of being, a, or a woman being uh, unfaithful. It could be motivated. It could be just that he's very uncertain, or it could be he uses it as an argument to use physical violence. We don't know. But what I know is there is a very strong correlation between accusation of unfaithfulness and domestic violence. So I tried to use this to see if there is a change in this correlation. And here is a figure that might look uh, odd to most to some of you. It's called predictive mar margins, but I'll explain it. So it, the first you see in 2010, the blue and the red shows uh, the impact where for for the, for 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 departments without, uh, with a policy and without a policy when there's, and when the woman says that she's not accused of unfaithfulness. So, in, in, so, so in, uh, uh, partner violence is a bit over 12% in this group. And there's little change between 2010 and 2015. And then on top, we have what happens when the woman is accused of being unfaithful. So first you see that uh, in the departments where, where they have policy, it's likely more common, violence is likely more common than, than the others. But there's a clear change in the correlations over time. So in, in 2015, there are clearly less and significantly less uh, women that are they're accused of being unfaithful, but it doesn't result or it doesn't, is not correlated with violence, physical violence. So I think this is an indication in, in, in the change of behavior, maybe in the change of attitudes. Okay, so let me conclude. So to summarize, in the department with the gender policy, 
physically viol physical violence decreased from 20 to 16 percent, but it stayed at about 18 percent in the other departments. Sexual violence decreased in both departments from 5.6 to 3.4 in the terms of policy and a bit less in the others. And, and, and if you take an overall, you can say that the physical and sexual violence decreased by about 20 percent in, in, in in department of gender policy. So I think that the Colombian government's effort combined with or in with support of the UN, a lot of a lot of donors involved here and 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 some of the donors work directly with the departments to formulate these policies. The policies seem to have an impact. It does it hasn't ended uh, intimate partner violence. It's still a major problem. But 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 this, it seems to have an impact. Uh, but then, of course, I don't show exactly what caused the decline, so it would be nice to dig much deeper into this. Uh, one has to go and travel around and really have some inside information because there's so many activities and there are over 30, 30 departments and they have, you know, that they are different. Uh, and it would also be nice to see what happened in other countries. I haven't done that. So um, thank you.